Firstly, I would like to share my happiness that many students of knowledge have turned up for today's short discussion on Ulum al Quran and the sciences of Al Quran al Kareem. And also, people who are not formal students of knowledge have turned up, some of them turning up early. A particular brother here turned up just after Asr prayer, the late noon prayer, enthusiastic regarding this subject. And the reason for choosing this subject for our monthly discussions, and inshallah, Allah willing, every month a different subject will be chosen that is relevant, is because if someone is unfamiliar with a subject like Ulum al Quran, the science of Al Quran al Karim in this day and age, they could become prey to the videos that are sent around on these devices, WhatsApp devices or on YouTube, where people place doubts regarding the Quran, regarding the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam, regarding uh, al fiqh jurisprudence and such type of things one of those subjects is ulum al quran the sciences of the quran that every muslim must have a rudimentary understanding of the revelation of the quran the history of the writing down of the quran as well as the history of the recitation of al quran al kareem and an understanding of hermeneutics how Muslims interpret the Qur'an, how the Qur'an must be interpreted correctly and the various aspects that are observed by the scholars of the Qur'an when they discuss the sciences of the Qur'an. How do we start this subject? In previous lectures I have already covered the revelation of the Qur'an and the history of the writing down of the Qur'an. But today's topic was Ulum al-Qur'an, which is the sciences of the Qur'an. Some people may be under the impression that the sciences of the Qur'an is only inclusive of what we know as Mu'ajaz al-Qur'an, the miraculous aspect of the Qur'an. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ لَا إِنِ اجْتَمَعَتِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُّ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لَا يَأْتُونَ بِمِثْلِهِ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ ظَهِيرًا That say, meaning the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is commanded to say if jinn kind, and note jinn is always mentioned first as opposed to human, why? Because jinn was created first. So the subtleties of the Qur'an in how the Qur'an mentions certain things, there is a subtlety throughout the Qur'an that if jinn kind and humankind gathered, insu wal jinnu, here the humankind is mentioned first as opposed to the jinn kind. Why? Because the challenge, generally speaking, the jinn is mentioned first, like وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create jinn and humankind except to worship me. Why was the jinn worship uh, the jinn mentioned first in that previous verse? Because the verse relates to creation of jinn. So the jinn was mentioned first. But in this verse, قُلْ لَا إِنِجْتَمَعَةِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُّ that ins is mentioned first. Why? Because the revelation of the Quran was sent down upon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who was a human being, and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam first conveyed Al Quran al Karim to Al Ins, humankind. That if this humankind and jinn kind gathered to bring something similar to this Quran, la yatuna bi mithlihi, they cannot even bring something similar to it. وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ ظَاهِيرًا Even if they supported one another. This is in reference to just one aspect of Ulum Al-Qur'an, the sciences of Qur'an, which is known as I'ajaz Al-Qur'an, the miraculous aspect of Al-Qur'an al Kareem. This is just one branch of Ulum Al-Qur'an. So Ulum Al-Qur'an is a vast subject, but inshallah, 
today we will summarize some of that subject firstly how do we look at ulum al-quran the science of al-quran al-kareem that if we were to consider the numerous subjects that are discussed in al-quran al-kareem or in ulum al-quran specifically there are those discussions which relate to the revelation of the Qur'an. Meaning, we know from the report of Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhuma that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa now the report of Abdullah bin Abbas, when a Sahabi narrates a report, that report is called Mawquf. That the name of that report is Mawquf. But if that Sahabi relates something that he cannot state except with knowledge from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa it is given the judgment of being marfu' as a prophetic narration. So Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhuma states that the Quran was revealed from Allah al-Mahfuz. Allah al-Mahfuz is the preserved tablet. By the way, so many people, they object to Arabic terms being used, but I think Arabic jargon that relates to Islamic terms must be understood and memorized by people because a familiarity of the tongue develops an understanding of the deen, the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as much as possible, I translate the term also. Allah al mahfuz means the preserved tablet. That from the preserved tablet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Al Quran al Kareem to Al Bayt al Ma'mur, which is the house similar to Al Kaaba in the seventh heaven. Then from Al Baytul Ma'mur to the house which is in the first heaven which is known as Baytul Izza. From Baytul Izza over a period of 23 years the Quran was revealed upon the heart of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So from the aspect of the revelation of Al Quran Al Kareem we can divide the sciences of the Quran from different perspectives. One perspective is whether a verse is al-makki or whether a verse is al-madani. What does al-makki mean? Meaning whenever you open your Quran, your copy of the Quran, you will notice the Quran states, Surah al-Baqarah, Madaniyah. Chapter of al-Baqarah, the calf, Madaniyah, revealed in al-Madinah al munawwarah Meaning, majority of the chapter was revealed in al-Madinah al munawwarah So, from this aspect alone, there are two discussions, whether a chapter is Makki or whether a chapter is Madani. For our knowledge, we should know that the majority of the Qur'an is Makki. Majority of the Qur'an was revealed in Makkah al mukarrama In fact, entire chapters were revealed in one go. Like Surah Al-Kahf, chapter number 18 of Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem was revealed in one revelation. In one in, in revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the entire chapter, Surah Al-Kahf. Likewise, chapter number 12 of Al-Quran Al-Kareem, Surah Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam, that chapter was revealed in one go, one revelation. So majority of the Quran is revealed where? In Mecca al mukarrama So the majority of the Quran would be Makki, meaning the revelation was in Mecca al mukarrama A question here, if the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was traveling during those days, what would we term the revelation? The answer would be, we would consider where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was residing at the time. So if he alayhi salatu was salam was traveling, but was at that time a resident of Makkah al mukarramah that revelation would be termed Makki. If he was re residing in, in al Madinah al munawwara but traveling, meaning, he was a resident of al madinah al munawwara but to happen to be traveling, the revelation would be termed Madani. So the majority of the Qur'an is revealed in Makkah al mukarramah There are hallmarks of knowing whether this chapter is Makki or Madani. Like if the word Kalla comes, Kalla sawfa ta'alamun, thumma Kalla sawfa ta'alamun. The word Kalla has appeared, straight away you will know this is Makki, that this chapter was revealed in. Makkah al mukarrama Likewise, majority of the stories of the Qur'an, Qasas al-Qur'an, majority 
of Qasasul Quran were revealed in Makkah al mukarrama majority of the Qasasul Quran. Majority of the times where the mention of Iblis and the story with Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam, the majority of the times that was revealed in Makkah al mukarrama with the exception of Surah Al-Baqarah. That the majority of the times when you find the story of Iblis and he's disobeying to prostrate to Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam, that was revealed in Makkah al mukarrama So majority of the Quran was revealed in Makkah al mukarrama What chapters were revealed in Al-Madinatul Munawwara? What is the longest chapter of the Quran? The longest chapter of the Quran is Surah Al-Baqarah. Surah Al-Baqarah which consists of two and a half juz of Al-Quran al -Kareem. Those of you who attend regularly the Dars Al-Quran would be familiar of this. Two and a half juz of the Quran is Surah Al-Baqarah. Surah Al-Baqarah in its entirety was revealed in al madinatul Munawwara. Sometimes they have a dispute regarding one or two verses or a few verses within a large chapter. This verse may have been revealed in, another, in Mecca or this verse may have been revealed in al madinatul Munawwara. But the overall judgment they give it to the majority of the verses. So if the majority of the verses were revealed in al madinatul Munawwara, the chapter is termed as being Madani. Likewise, the three chapters that come after Surah Al-Baqarah, they are also Madani. Which chapter comes after Surah Al-Baqarah? Surah Ali Imran. You need to remind me my memory needs help. So I need the facilitation of the students of knowledge here. Surah Ali Imran. Likewise, after Surah, Surah Ali Imran, which chapter? Surah, Surah Nisa. Likewise, after Surah Nisa, Surah Ma'idah. These three chapters were also revealed in al madinatul Munawwara. So these are large chapters, but yet the majority of the Quran was revealed where? In Makkah al mukarramah Likewise, you have uh, Surah Al-Anfal, which is chapter number eight of al Quran al kareem You have Surah Al-Bara'ah. What is the other name of Surah Al-Bara'ah? Surah, Surah Al-Tawbah. Chapter number 9 of Al-Quran al kareem Likewise, Surah Al-Ra'ad, Surah Al-Hajj, Surah Al-Nur, Surah Al-Ahzab, and Surah Al-Qital. Which chapter is Surah Al-Qital? Surah Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then one of the names is Surah Al-Qital. Surah Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Likewise, Surah Al-Hadid and Surah Al-Tahrim, and Surah Al-Qiyam, and Surah Al-Qadr, and Surah Al-Zalzala, and Surah Al-Nasr. And Al Mu'awwidatan. Which chapters are Al Mu'awwidatan? The name Al Mu'awwidatan. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falak and Qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas. These two are termed as being Al Mu'awwidatan, meaning we seek refuge with Allah with these two chapters, recitation of these two chapters. So likewise, they have a dispute regarding Surah Al Rahman, Surah Al Insan, which is also known as Surah Al Dahr and Surah Al-Ikhlas and Surah Al-Fatiha there are three statements some of the ulama scholars said it was revealed in uh, Makkah al mukarrama others said it was revealed in al madinatul Munawwara but some scholars said it was revealed in both Makkah al mukarrama and al madinatul Munawwara both cities so what has also been said regarding these is that Surah Al-Nisa, Surah Al-Ra'ad, Surah Al-Hajj, Surah Al-Hadid, Surah Al-Saf, Surah Al-Taghabun, Taghabun, and Surah Al-Qiyamah, and Al-Mu'awwidatan, some have said these were revealed in Makkah Al-Mukarrama, but sometimes the revelation would occur twice. Some of the verses of Al-Quran Al-Kareem would be, re the same verse would be revealed twice to reinforce the meaning. So these are dividing the categories of the chapters of Al-Quran Al-Kareem to Makki and Madani. Likewise, so these are two types. Likewise, the scholars when they study commentary of the Quran, they must understand whether this chapter was revealed when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was residing, meaning not in a state of travel, or was the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam traveling and these type of chapters are referred to as Al-Hadari al and Al-Safari. If the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was 
resident and not traveling and a verse was revealed that verse is referred to as al hadari if the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is traveling that verse is referred to as as safari so the majority of the quran which one of the two uh, would it be it would be al hadari meaning it was revealed when the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not in a state of travel but if we analyze those verses of the quran which were revealed while the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was traveling then we can understand that the, the rest of the remainder of the quran is was revealed when the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was resident like surah al-fath what is surah al-fath surah al-fath is the chapter revealed regarding the victory of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam this was revealed while the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was traveling likewise the when the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was traveling verses of tayammum what is tayammum dry ablution meaning when there is a scarcity of water a person performs tayammum dry ablution that verse was revealed in surah al-maida but while the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was traveling so that would be considered a verse of safari meaning a verse revealed while traveling like this there are so many different verses of al-quran al-karim which are revealed when the messenger were revealed when the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was traveling so this is four types makki madani hadari safari additional to this verses that are revealed in the day and verses that are revealed in the night if the verse is revealed in the day that verse is referred to as annahari and if the verse is revealed in the night that verse is referred to as al-layli meaning uh, the verse that was revealed in the night majority of al-quran al-kareem was revealed in the daytime so which verses of al-quran al-kareem were revealed in the night for instance the previously mentioned chapter surah al-fath when the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was journeying toward Makkah al Makkah al Mukarrama in order to conquer Makkah al Mukarrama the chapter of al Fath was revealed when this chapter of al Fath uh, sorry the revelation of al Fath was prior to the conquering of Makkah al Mukarrama after the treaty of Hudaybiyah so in in the year 6 The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam signed the treaty of Hudaybiyah with the Quraysh and many people were wondering how will we ever have victory so on the way back returning back from Hudaybiyah back to Al Madinatul Munawwara while traveling Surah Al Fath was revealed informing the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam regarding his victory and conquering of Makkah Al Mukarrama this is one of the aspects of Ijaz Al Quran miraculousness of the Quran that the Quran has numerous predictions that occurred after the revelation some of majority of which have occurred but many which have not yet occurred there are numerous predictions pr- prophecies in the Quran which are yet to happen so when the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was traveling this revelation of the chapter is called safari because the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was traveling but the revelation was at night time the revelation was at night therefore the revelation is a layli meaning a night time revelation so a combination of both would it count as makki or madani the answer would be madani why madani because the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam at the time was a resident of al madinatul munawwara likewise ayatul qibla What is Ayatul Qibla? The Ayatul Qibla is found in which chapter of the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah. In Surah Al-Baqarah, toward the end the start of the second uh, juz of the Quran and also toward the end of the first juz of the Quran. Ayatul Qibla was to inform the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to instruct him to change the direction of the prayer from Al-Quds Al-Sharif in Jerusalem toward Makkah Al-Mukarramah these verses 
of the Qibla were revealed at night time. So those verses are also called Layli, meaning these verses were revealed at night time. So those types of verses are Layli. In total, this would count to six types of verses now. You have Makki, you have Madani, you have Safari, you have Hadari, you have Layli, and you have Nahari. Uh, Makki meaning revealed in Makkah al-Mukarramah, Madani meaning revealed in Al-Madinah al munawwarah Safari meaning revealed in travel. Al-Hadari meaning revealed when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was not traveling. Al-Layli meaning revealed at night. Al-Nahari meaning what? Revealed during the day. <coughs> Likewise, you have a Saifi and a Shita'i. A Saifi is those verses that were revealed in summer and a Shita'i are those verses which were revealed in winter. Example of a verse revealed in the summertime is what they refer to as Ayatul Kalala. Surah An-Nisa contains all the verses relating to inheritance laws. In fact, from the legal rulings, which legal, which group of legal rulings are detailed in the Quran more than any other legal rulings, more than the prayer. Those legal rulings are the legal rulings of inheritance laws. Why are inheritance laws detailed in the Quran? Because majority of the other legal rulings were left to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa to explain. But the legal rulings relating to the rights of inheritance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself revealed the laws in order that no two people may dispute because human beings have been created with a like for wealth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses of <coughs> inheritance laws in Surah An-Nisa. Why in Surah An-Nisa, the chapter of women? Because women in those times, their rights were taken away and they were not given their portion of the inheritance. Of course, there is a discussion on women's inheritance laws and Islam. So many people object to some of the inheritance laws, but uh, today is not the time for that discussion. In those verses there is Ayatul Kalala. Ayatul Kalala is a verse revealed regarding the person who dies with no relatives. So when this verse was revealed, Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa regarding Al Kalala, the person who dies with no relatives. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded to him, Ala takfika ayatu sayf, is not the verse of the summertime sufficient for you? So this shows that the verse was revealed in summertime. Likewise, there are verses of the Quran which are revealed in wintertime. Those are called shita'i, winter ayat. Like when the verses of Al-Ifq, meaning Al-Ifq was an event, historical event, where, where the hypocrites, Al-Munafiqoon, they made certain assumptions and claims regarding Sayyidatuna Aisha radiallahu anha, who was innocent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses of Al-Quran al-Kareem. In fact, Surah An-Nur, the chapter known as Light, Surah An-Nur. This chapter was revealed, but the verses which are referred to uh, uh, regarding Bara'atu Aisha radiallahu anha that uh, absolved Sayyidatuna Aisha radiallahu anha from any wrongdoing. Those verses were revealed in Surah An-Nur in winter time. So those are referred to as Shita'i. So like this we have eight categories. You have Makki, Madani, uh, uh, Safari, Al-Hadari, what else? Al-Layli, Al-Nahari, Al-Sayfi, and a shita'i, eight categories of the verses of Al Quran Al Karim. After this, a ninth category is a type of verse known as Al Firashi, meaning those verses which were revealed when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is resting on bed, on the bed. So while resting on the bed, like Surah Al Kawthar, Inna Aatayna Al Kawthar, the shortest chapter of Al Quran Al Karim, which the challenge stands, meaning. If you are able to imitate the Quran, what does this entail, the, the challenge? 
the challenge in, in, in Al-Quran Al-Kareem. In kuntum fi raybin mimma nazzalna ala abdina. If you are in any doubt regarding what we have revealed upon our servant. Fa'atu bi suratim min mithlihi. That bring a chapter like it. Fa'atu bi suratim min mithlihi. Has two uh, translations. Bring a chapter of its like or bring a chapter from his like. Meaning from the like of Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Both things are impossible. You cannot have a likeness to the Quran and you can never have a likeness to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Why? Because he is Khatamun Nabiyyin. You can never have two Khatamun Nabiyyin coexisting at the same time. There is only one Khatamun Nabiyyin, finality of Prophets. So, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ Bring a chapter of its like. Does not mean taking some verses of the Qur'an and chapters, uh, verses of the Qur'an, uh, placing them together and then making something uh, similar to the Qur'an in uh, reorganizing words of the Qur'an again. No, it was a challenge which, which, stand, uh, which stood at that time and still stands today. Bring something of your own device, your own rhetoric, of your own doing, not an imitation of the Qur'an. So, Surah Al-Kawthar was revealed when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was lying down. Likewise, there are numerous other uh, verses that, or chapters of the, uh, verses of the Qur'an, which were revealed at night time when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was lying down. This brings us to the 10th uh, discussion regarding something known as Asbabun Nuzul. Asbabun Nuzul is looking at the reasons of the revelation. Why that verse of the Quran was revealed. Knowing Asbabun Nuzul brings clarity to understanding the, mean, uh, the meanings of Al Quran Al Karim. Knowing the reasons behind why certain verses of the Quran uh, were revealed. How would we know Asbabun Nuzul? from the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. Of course, there are numerous examples of Asbab al-Nuzul. And this is why scholars wrote down works like Al-Imam Jalaluddin Abdul Rahman al-Suyuti Rahimallahu Ta'ala wrote Lubab al-Nuqul fi Asbab al-Nuzul. There are early works of Al-Wahidi, a famous scholar called Al-Wahidi. He wrote a comprehensive work on Asbab al-Nuzul. Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar al-Asqalani rahimallahu ta'ala also has a book on Asbab al-Nuzul. But what benefit does Asbab al-Nuzul give? It gives clarity to the context of the verse. Clarity to the context of the verse. So many verses of the Quran can be misquoted by people that when they misquote those verses, the context is not clear at all. But once when you look at Asbab al-Nuzul, Sabab al-Nuzul, the reason of revelation, the context uh, becomes clear. That the context of the verse was this, and this is why Al-Quran al-Kareem may state uh, such a thing. Examples of that is the verse of Asayu, which is what? An example is that the companions, the Quran mentions that running between a Safa and Al Marwa is not a sin. Someone reading this verse will wonder why is the Quran mentioning running between a Safa mountain or hillock, the hill of uh, a Safa and an, an Marwa, the two hillocks, running between them is not a sin. A person will start thinking, why is the Quran mentioning this? The reason was that there were idols placed on top of those two hillocks and the some of the companions Ali Muridwan were doubtful regarding the running between the two hillocks because they observed that the, the, the hillocks had idols placed on top so al quran al kareem informed them that there is no sin for you to do a sa'yu running between the two hillocks but this is the the sabab the cause is not mentioned in the quran a person may read that verse and misunderstand the context of the verse, but when you refer back to Sabab al Nuzul, the reason of the revelation, the, the meaning becomes more clear. And this is why some of those verses can be taken out of context by uh, Orientalists. Additional to this, an 11th, re, uh, an 11th aspect of Ulum al Quran is studying 
the first verses of the Quran that were revealed. What were the first verses of Al-Quran Al-Kareem revealed? Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. So the first five verses of Surah to Iqra were the first verses of Al-Quran Al-Kareem revealed. And then uh, after that, uh, Surah Al-Mudathir. Surah Al-Mudathir. In Al-Madinah Al-Munawwara, what were the first verses revealed of Al-Quran Al-Kareem? Waylun lil mutaffifin. Meaning the chapter, Waylun lil mutaffifin which is in Juz Amma, in the last Juz of the Qur'an, the first chapter revealed in Al-Madinatul Munawwara. Others have said Surah Al-Baqarah was revealed in Al-Madinatul Munawwara. Others have mentioned that Surah Al-Baqarah was the first chapter revealed in Al-Madinatul Munawwara. Like this, a twelfth aspect of Ulum Al-Qur'an or Tafsir Al-Qur'an, what is essential upon an individual to know when interpreting the Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem is to know the last verses of Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem which were revealed. There is a dispute. The scholars dispute what were the last verses of Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem. What statements do they have? Some of them have said Ayatul Kalala. Ayatul Kalala, the verse that is in Surah Al-Nisa regarding inheritance laws. Some of them have mentioned this. Others have said Ayatul Riba. The verse of Arriba. In reality, these <coughs> verses were from amongst the last verses revealed. Ayatul Riba, the verse of Riba, was the last verse revealed for a reason. Because it relates to the fourth dimension of the knowledge of Islam. Because if we divide knowledge into four categories, the knowledge would be Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and Ashratu Sa'a, which is Islam, the legal aspects, Iman, belief, Ihsan, the state of perfection, the spiritual state of perfection, and the fourth, the signs of the end of times. Ayatul Riba relates to Ahkam, legal rulings, as well as Ashratul Sa'a, meaning an indication toward what will occur in the end of times of the profusion of Riba in the world, which is mentioned in the Hadith. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam states that a time shall occur, shall take place, that riba usually shall be so widespread that anyone who does not partake of usury, meaning consume usury, will be touched by its dust, meaning the dust will touch him. This is a reflection of our times. You have the banking system which does not leave any individual except that they touch some aspect of riba. So, Ayatul Riba being the last verse being revealed, and when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away, he had left his armor with a Jew. He had left his armor with a Jew as uh, as insurance to pay him back his debt. This was done by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam on purpose, because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would have always paid off any debt. But this was an indication to his nation regarding what the what will occur in the end of times regarding debt that muslims and non-muslims will be indebted to the riba system so some of them said that ayatul riba was the last verse others have said and this is the most authentic the verse in surah al-baqarah verse number 28 of surah al-baqarah uh, this verse is an indicator to the passing away of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ Which means, <coughs> have taqwa of that day which you all shall return back. تُرْجَعُونَ An indication to the passing away of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Others have said the last of Surah uh, Tawbah, chapter number 9, the last verses of Surah Tawbah. And others have said Surah Al-Nasr. What is the most authentic statement? The most authentic statement is وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ This verse, the entirety of the verse, was the last verse revealed of Al-Quran Al-Kareem. Nine days before passing away. Nine days before the Messenger of Allah passed away, this verse was revealed. The other verses were also uh, revealed, but they were not the final verses. Like the verse of Al-Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum, this verse 
uh, re relating to perfection of the religion. Some of them thought that this is the last verse which was revealed. But that verse was revealed in the Hajj. When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed Hajjatul Wida' The Farewell Pilgrimage. So like this we have 12 things that the commentator of the Quran looks at. Which is whether a verse is Makki, whether a verse is Madani, whether a verse is Safari, whether a verse is Hadari, whether a verse is Layli, whether a verse is Nahari, whether a verse is Shita'i, whether a verse is Saifi, whether uh, also, what was the ninth? Firashi. Additional to that, number 10 was Sababun Nuzul, looking at the reasons of the revelation. And number 11, what was the first of the Quran revealed and what was the last of the Quran revealed? Was the Quran written down in its entirety in the life of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The answer is yes. The entire Quran was written down. Whenever any verse of the Quran would be revealed, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have it written down. And the, the writers of the Quran were known as Kuttab. The scribes who would write down Al-Quran al -Karim. Those verses which were written down, the written verses would be placed in the house of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anyone else who wanted a copy, they would copy from the copy of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then they would memorize. How many companions memorized the entire Quran in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The answer is thousands. In one incident, uh, known as the incident of Bi'ru Ma'una, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dispatched 70 Qurra, memorizers of the Quran, who were martyred in Najd, in Eastern Arabian Penins uh, Peninsula. 70 of memorizers of the Quran were martyred, meaning this shows the extent to which the memorization of the Quran was done by within the circles of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Likewise, in the Battle of Al-Yamama, in the Battle of Al-Yamama, in the Khilafah Caliphate of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, 70 companions were martyred who had memorized the entire Quran. So this led Sayyiduna Abu Bakr radiallahu an, after Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an advised him to write down an official copy of the Quran. They dispatched Zayd bin Thabit radiallahu an to carry out this task because he was young and energetic. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa previously had ordered Zayd radiallahu an to learn Hebrew in order to understand the uh, Torah and be able to refute the Jews in al madinatul Munawwara. So Sayyiduna Zayd radiallahu an would find two witnesses for each verse. What does this entail? What does finding two witnesses entail? Because some people misinterpret this. Orientalists and non-Muslims who target the Quran regularly, they point this out. Why was he finding two witnesses? The answer to that is, Zayd radiallahu an was finding two witnesses who had witnessed the writing down of that particular verse in the presence of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he says, I found witnesses for every verse except one verse, I found one witness, what does he mean? He means witnesses who had witnessed down the, the writing of the verse, but this does not mean that no one else had that verse. Because thousands of the, of the companions had already memorized the Quran. He was a familiar of the verse himself. But he wanted to find witnesses who had observed the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam writing down that particular verse. So this was the reason for the compilation of Al-Quran al, al in the time of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an. But the, the Quran had already been written down in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then we move on to, after these 12 aspects, we move on to that which goes to the transmission of the Quran. How the Quran was transmitted. 
So we have the right compilation and the writing down of Al Quran Al Karim, how the Quran was written down, but how was the recitation transmitted? This, firstly, the transmission that reaches us, which is considered Al Quran Al Karim, is considered mutawatir. What is mutawatir? Mass transmitted. Meaning, so many of the companions narrate the Qur'an that it is impossible for them to agree upon a lie. So the Qur'an that we have today, the number of people that re recite the Qur'an has reached us through mass transmission. Someone, someone may say how? In the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were around 110,000 companions. Let's say for argument's sake, only 1,000 memorized the entire Quran. In fact, there were more. But if we, if when discussing with a non-Muslim or people who object to the Quran, you say to them, if there were 1,000 people who had memorized the entire Quran, they may say, no, we disagree, not 1,000. Okay, for argument's sake, we move the number down to 100. 100 people had memorized the entire Quran over 6,600 6, verses of the Quran. Over 6,600. From those 50 companions, the next generation, how many people took the Quran from them? thousands of people how the likes of Ubay bin Ka'ab radiallahu an Abu Ad-Darda Sayyiduna Abu Ad-Darda one example he went to Damascus when he entered Damascus he settled in Damascus in the Grand Umayyad Masjid al Jami al Umuwi he taught 10 students so 10 students recited the Quran to him by memory each student he in, assigned to him 10 students so like this each student would sit with 10 more students and then the supervising was done by Abu ad darda he would supervise the entire reading so one student will teach 10 the other student will teach 10 the other student will teach 10 like this over a hundred students who would supervise them Abu ad darda when each student graduated memorized the entire Quran, recited the Quran the way Abu Ad-Darda had learned directly from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Each student then was dispatched to different masajid to start and initiate his own circle of the Quran. Like this from Abu Ad-Darda alone, one companion, how many people transmitted the Quran? Just students of knowledge, thousands. So imagine the common people, how many of the common lay people heard and memorized parts of the Qur'an. So if you have 50 companions like this, transmitting the Qur'an, likewise if you have a hundred or two hundred or a thousand of those companions transmitting Al-Qur'an al Karim, the next generation, hundreds and thousands if not millions transmitted the Qur'an. So like this, every generation, millions of people transmitted Al-Qur'an al Karim. So if someone finds one manuscript, handwritten manuscript of the Qur'an, which has certain chapters missing, by the way, none of these manuscripts have a different Qur'an. None of them have a different Qur'an. They may have mistakes of copyists, spelling mistakes, or the orthography may differ slightly, spelling, the spelling may differ slightly, or they may transmit some parts of the Qur'an and miss other parts like a partial copy of the Qur'an. This does not in any way affect the authenticity of Al-Qur'an al karim in any way or form. So this was in relation to the Qira'at, how the Qira'at were transmitted. Meaning when the companions, alayhim ridwan, famous companions, recited Al-Qur'an al karim they transmitted the Qur'an to their students. So examples of famous companions, you have, for instance, Sayyiduna Uthman radiallahu an, the Khalifa. You have Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. 
You have Sayyiduna Ubay bin Ka'ab. You have Sayyiduna Zayd, Zayd bin Thabit, radiallahu an, the one who was tasked to compile Al-Quran Al-Kareem in the time of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr and in the time of Sayyiduna Uthman radiallahu an. Likewise, you have Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an, who settled in Al-Kufa. Likewise, you have Sayyiduna Abu Ad-Darda, the companion who settled in Damascus. Likewise, you have Sayyiduna Mu'adh bin Jabal. You have Sayyiduna Abu Zayd al-Ansari. You have Sayyiduna Abu Huraira, Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Abbas, and Sayyiduna Abdullah bin As-Sa'ib. These are famous reciters. What do Orientalists do? Sometimes they cite a hadith which states that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa instructs the companions or to take the Quran from specific companions or a companion like Anas bin Malik radiallahu an will say no one had perfected the Quran in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa except these four. They will mention a report that says this to confuse people. But the context of the report is twofold. Number one, Sayyiduna Anas radiallahu an was sitting with a group of Ansar. He was from the Ansar. And the Ansar are divided into two categories, Aus and Khazraj. One of them boasted in a good way, meaning regarding the, the virtues of two of the Ansar. So Sayyiduna Anas radiallahu an retorted by saying, no one had mastered the Quran except these four because two of them were Quraysh and two were from his tribe. This was the context of the quote. But even if we move away from the context of the quote, the meaning of the quote is that none of these companions had perfected the Quran as much as these four. Why? Because these four, including Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an, had learned the entire Quran with all its ahruf, methods of recitation, directly from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning, other companions may have memorized the entire Quran, but they may have memorized some portions of the Quran from another companion. But these four, what did they do? They went directly to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they learned all the different methods of recitation. What do we mean by different methods? Simple examples. In Surah Al-Fatiha we recite Maliki Yawmiddin. You can also recite this verse as Maliki Yawmiddin. This is one variation. Another example, Wadduha. You can recite as Wadduha with Al-Imala. Wadduha. These differences that occur are due to the dialects of the Arabs. That when Sayyiduna Jibreel alayhi salam revealed the Qur'an upon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, amongst the Arabs we have different dialects. Some of the older people and some of the younger people may find it difficult to recite in one harf, according to one letter. So eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Al-Qur'an al kareem in seven ahruf which is referred to as Sab'atu Ahruf, in seven letters, meaning the recitation may differ slightly only in the way the letters are pronounced. This is why it is termed as being Harf, because the way the letter is pronounced. This transmission then was transmitted down to the companions, and from the companions, the companions taught thousands of students, and this is what we call Qira'at, the Qira'at is distinct to the Harf. How? Qira'at is in reference to the chain of narration. Qira'at is in reference to the chain of narration. The distinction of recitation is in reference to the Harf, meaning the, the reason for the distinction is due to the Harf, but the chain of narration is referred to as Qira'at. So these companions, Ali Muridwan, they taught thousands of uh, tabi'een. What do we mean by tabi'een? The word at tabi'een refers to successors, meaning those who came after the companions, at tabi'een. Then those who came after them are referred to as atba'u tabi'een. 
So at Tabi'een, from the Tabi'een, successors, you have famous reciters. From amongst them, for instance, you have Yazid bin al Qa'qa and Abdul Rahman al A'raj and Mujahid, and also Sa'id ibn Jubayr, as well as Ikrima, Na'ata bin Abi Rabah, Al Hassan al Basri, Al Qama al Aswad, Azir bin Hubayj, Abida, Masruq, and the ten Qurra take from them. So the ten famous Qira'at, how many Qira'at are they that have reached us? through mass transmission, 10 Qira'at. In total, there are 10 Qira'at. What are the names of the Qurra, <coughs> the famous Qurra? The seven, you hear about the seven Qira'at. In, uh, in total, there are 10. 10 Qira'at. The, name of the names of the seven is Nafi' ibn Kathir, who's from Mecca al-Mukarrama, ibn Kathir. Not the Mufassir, not to be confused with the a Mufassir who came later in Damascus. Likewise, you have Ibn Umar, Ibn Amir, Asim, Hamza, and Al-Kisai. The Qira'ah that we recite is from Asim, Al-Kufi. His student Hafs narrates the Qira'ah from him, and this Qira'ah has reached us through mass transmission. There is one additional point to be made regarding this, and that is that some people make an absurd objection they say firstly they say these qiraat did not reach us through mass transmission if you ask them why they will say the name of the qari is one so asim is one asim al kufi how can you say this qiraa is mutawatir how do you answer this absurd objection you answer by saying when we say Asim is one reciter, it does not mean that Asim was alone in narrating that Qira'ah. The number of people that narrated that Qira'ah from the teachers of Asim were numerous, were hundreds, if not thousands. But the reason why the scholars pinpointed Asim or those reciters is because they lived long and they taught for the longest. And because of the perfection of the Qira'ah, the entire Qira'ah is attributed to them. It does not mean Asim formulated his own Qira'ah, no. Asim, was, Asim al-Kufi rahimahullah ta'ala, was transmitting the Qira'ah from his teachers. But that Qira'ah was transmitted from, by numerous students. But Asim al-Kufi, the, the Qira'ah is attributed to him. Why? Because he had perfected the Qira'ah because of the perfection and for having taught the Qira'ah for decades. Because they taught for decades, the Qira'ah is attributed to them. So this objection falls apart. Additional to this objection, one of the objections that the person makes is that the, these Qura'ah, they devise the Qira'ah themselves. This is also false. How do we falsify this claim? The claim is falsified by the fact that the Qira'at do not contradict one another. The Qira'at do not contradict one another. They only differ in how certain letters and words are pronounced. There is no contradiction. If they were formulating their own Qur'an, then they would contradict one another. And no such thing occurs. So this is the summary of an objection which is raised by some people and may have confused some of these people who studied 10 years in al Madinatul Munawwara and after having studied 10 years in al Madinatul Munawwara they enrolled into Harvard University and their minds were filled with doubts they were unable to answer these objections meaning what did they study for 10 years if they are unable to answer such absurd objections then after this what does additional to this what does a Mufassir, a commentator of the Qur'an look at, he looks at something known as Al-Waqfu Wal-Ibtida where the awqaf, where the waqf, where the full stops occur and where the beginning of a sentence occurs. How many of you, of you have heard that the Qur'an consists of 6,666 verses? How many of you have you heard that being attributed to Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu anhu? 
So the meaning of this is what? Because you may read other reports which mention a different number. So a person reading this may become confused. How can they differ over the number of verses? The reason is this relates back to the Qira'at. That sometimes the, the Qari may stop at a verse and that would be considered a full stop. But other Qari's may continue. So one verse, according to one Qari, one Muqri, one reciter, will be consisting of two verses according to another. And this is where the number may differ slightly. So this is another aspect known as Al-Waqfu wal ibtidab What does this do? This affects the way you understand certain verses. How? Again, there's no contradiction. One Qira'ah elucidates the meaning of another. They do not contradict one another. What do they do? They elucidate, they complement one another. And exa- another uh, additional thing which the reciters of Al Quran Al Karim may look at is something known as Al Imala, which I mentioned already, which is how a letter of the Quran is recited, how particular letters of the Quran are recited. Or the Mad, how the Mad is recited. The Mad in total, the Mad, the stretching of the letters are nine types. So the Quran. They may differ slightly on certain mud. Likewise, the Hamza. If any of you heard the recitation in Morocco, so, uh, the recitation Qira'atu Warsh, you will notice they do not recite the Quran, they do not recite certain words with the Hamza. So if we recite as Yu'minun, how do they recite? They say Yu'minun. Yu'minun. This is one of the distinctions of the Ahruf. They say Yu'minun. Or we say what duha, some of them may recite at the Qur'an, they may recite as what duha. This is al-imala. These are certain distinctions found. Likewise, idgham, joining letters. Sometimes some Qur'an may make two letters distinct, but other Qur'an, they may make the two letters, they may join, conjoin those two letters. This is referred to as al-idgham. Like I said, where do these uh, differences find their root? The answer is when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught the companions, he taught them the Quran with seven ahruf, and the seven ahruf were inclusive of the letters, meaning the differing in the letters. How was this transmitted to different cities? In which year did Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an compile the Qur'an? In the year 12 after Hijri. In the year after 12. So after the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa passed away, when he passed away, alayhi salatu wa salam, in the year 10. Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an in the second year of his Khilafah, ordered Sayyiduna Zayd bin, Zayd bin Thabit radiallahu an to write down the entire Qur'an as an official copy. This was in the year 12. In the year 25, Sayyiduna Uthman radiallahu an dispatched seven copies of the Quran to different cities. He kept one in Al-Madinatul Munawwara, dispatched one to Mecca Al-Mukarramah, another to Al-Kufa, another to Al-Basra, another to Damascus, another to Yemen, another to Egypt, and also one to Bahrain. With these volumes of the Qur'an, what did he do? Firstly, he tasked Sayyiduna Zayd bin Thabit radiallahu an to write down the Qur'an in seven copies. And he sent down these copies to those cities, saying to everyone, get rid of your personal copies. Why? Why did he order this? Because when a person has a personal copy, he may write down according to his own spelling style. Meaning, the word, uh, the verse, Maliki Yawmiddin, you can spell this as Meem Alif, Lam and Kaf. You can also spell this as Meem Lam Kaf. Two ways of spelling one word. Sayyiduna Uthman radiallahu an ordered Sayyiduna Zayd, Zayd radiallahu an to write down the entire Quran in the way that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had written down the Quran. And then when he dispatched those copies, he ordered everyone 
to erase their own copies and to copy down from those copies. This was the reasoning behind this. So what did they do? Their own personal copies, they washed away the ink and then they burnt the paper. They washed away the ink and they burnt the paper. And then they had new copies written down. With, why? In order to write down the Quran according to the way that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had written down the Quran, had the Quran written. Additional to this, Sayyiduna Uthman radiallahu an sent companions with the Quran, meaning not just a copy of the Quran, companions with the Quran to teach the new Muslims how to recite the Quran correctly. And this is how the Qiraat spread. So in Al Kufa, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an was the, one of the most foremost teachers of the Quran. Likewise, in other cities, you had different companions. When they taught the Quran, then the transmitters of the Quran from them became known as the Qura or the Qiraat. So this is how the Quran was transmitted. This transmission of the written Quran is known as the Rasmul Quran. Known as what? Rasmul Quran. Orthography of the Quran. What does orthography mean? It means the way the Quran is spelt. Not the uh, calligraphy. The calligraphy can differ. So if you open a Quran from published in the Arabian Peninsula or in the Middle East, you will find that it is written in Al-Khattu Ruqa'i. Al-Khattu Ruqa'i is a particular type of calligraphy. If you open the Quran published in Africa, you will find different spelling, uh, not spelling, different calligraphy. If you open the Quran published in India and Pakistan, you will find al khat al Mughali, the Mughal Khat, the style, the that that is in reference to the calligraphy, but the orthography, Rasmul Quran is one, the the spelling of the Quran is one. Initially, when the Quran was written down, it was written down without fatha, kasra, dhamma, meaning the vowels, zabr, zair, kasra, zair, pesh. These are the vowels. Without these vowels, the Quran was written down. And without the dots. Later on, they added the dots and the vowels in order to facilitate the reading for people. So how did people know how to recite? When the volume of the Quran was dispatched, the reciter of the Quran would teach the people how to recite. So the orthography of the Quran was transmitted with the recitation. Both went hand in hand. Later on, they divided the Quran into 30 ajza, 30 juz, and 60 hizb. 60 hizb, meaning one juz of the Quran is two hizb. Likewise, they wrote down things like manzil, at the bottom of the Quran, manzil. Why manzil? Because the Quran can be recited in its entirety in seven days. So they write down manzil at the bottom. Why in seven days? Because the companions would recite Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran. Then they would recite, the next day they would recite additional chapters. Then the next day they would recite additional chapters, seven chapters, then nine chapters, then eleven chapters, then thirteen chapters. Then on the seventh day they would finish the entire Quran. So they wrote down Manzil. This is how the Quran reached us. So now what the Orientalists do is that they may pick out a random copy of the Quran with spelling mistakes and so with one copy say that the Quran has mistakes because we found one manuscript. But how do we explain this? That in those days people would write down the Quran with their hands. So a copyist may make a mistake sometimes. But nowhere have they found an, a, a different Quran to the Quran that we have today. Meaning the thousands of manuscripts of the Quran are the same as the Quran that we have today and the Quran has a chain of transmission of millions of people every year memorizing Al-Quran al kareem This is truthful <coughs> to the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Al-Quran al kareem Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafizun Surely we have revealed this remembrance meaning the Quran and we will surely preserve this remembrance meaning the Quran will be preserved. What additional things does a Mufassir or what relates to Ulum al-Qur'an? What additional things does a, 
a commentator of the Quran look at. One of those things is known as Gharibul Quran. Gharibul Quran does not mean oddities or rarities in this case, even though ling- linguistically Gharib means a rarity. It refers to finding the individual meanings of words of the Quran. If a commentator is to comment upon the meanings of Al Quran Al Karim, what he observes when commenting on Al Quran Al Karim is the linguistical meanings of those words and the linguistical allusions of those words. This is referred to as Gharib Al Quran Al Gharib. Additional to that, so this is first from the aspect of language, one, Al Gharib. A second thing which the commentator of the Quran looks at is something known as Al-Mu'arrab. What is known as Al-Mu'arrab, and this is something, an objection some non-Muslims bring up, is words that have a foreign origin. The origin of the word may be foreign, but those words were incorporated into the Quran, or incorporated, we would say more correctly, incorporated into the Arabic language. And the Quran mentions those words. These words are referred to as Al-Mu'arrab. Examples are the words Al-Mishkat, Al-Mishkat, or the word Al-Kifl, or the word Al-Abwah, or the word Al-Sijil, or the word Al-Qistas. Like this, around 60 words are found in Al-Quran al karim How many words? 60 words in Al Quran Al Karim, which some people may claim have a foreign origin. Some of the scholars rejected this. They said Al Quran Al Karim does not have any foreign words. In fact, they may share those words with other foreign languages, but the, those words are Arab, Arabic also. But other scholars accepted this. They said they said that the Arabic language adopted those words and Arabized those words, but. Here we have something to note historically that when Sayyiduna Ismail salam settled in the valley of Bakka, meaning Mecca al mukarramah the Arabic language was intense and difficult to pronounce. After Sayyiduna Ismail salam married a woman from the Qahtani Arabs and the Arabs populated the valley of Mecca al mukarramah meaning the the offspring of Ismail is a type of Arab. The language became more, meaning the language honed itself, meaning the language went to a a level of sophistication, which in uh, English we would refer to this as philology, meaning in Arabic, fiqhul lugha. Fiqhul lugha is understanding the roots of Arabic language, uh, or understanding the roots of any language. Their language was refined to such a point that the era of the revelation of the Quran arrived and the Quran was revealed. During that time, those foreign words were incorporated and adopted into the Arabic language. So this was uh, what the scholars uh, discuss as known as fiqhul lugha. So this is what they study which is known as al-mu'arrab. Additional to this, is what the scholars must study is called Al-Majaz. What is Al-Majaz? Understanding allegory in the Quran. Al-Majaz, meaning when they study the Quran, they must understand, is there is there a hidden word in the meaning here? If there is a hidden word in the meaning, then what is that uh, hidden word and what is the meaning? This is known as Al-Majaz. So allegory in Al-Quran al karim Example of that, a famous example in Surah to Yusuf Ali Salam, the brothers of Yusuf Ali Salam, they go back, they go to Egypt, they return back from Egypt to Sayyiduna Yaqub Ali Salam. When they come back to Sayyiduna Yaqub Ali Salam, they relate the story that Binyamin was held behind. Why was Binyamin held behind? Because he Sayyiduna Yusuf salam placed with the knowledge of bin Yamin the cup a suwa, the cup in the bag of bin Yamin and then he kept bin Yamin behind 
on the pretext that he had stolen. So when they went back to Sayyiduna Yaqub alayhi salam, Sayyiduna Yaqub alayhi salam did not believe them. Because previously they had lied when they brought the shirt of Yusuf alayhi salam intact. They said a wolf had eaten him and the shirt was intact, covered with blood. Meaning any individual would know what an intelligent wolf that he took off the shirt uh, without uh, making a tear in the shirt at all. So Sayyidina Yaqub salam knew. So they said, Was alil qarya. Ask the village. Now, this is an example of majaz in the Quran, allegory. Who, when you go to ask the village, do you ask the village, the, the, the houses and the walls? Who do you ask? People. The people. Well done. The people of the village. So the meaning would be, Was'al ahl al qarya. Ask the people of the village. This is an example of majaz. Scholars must be able to determine the allegory in Al Quran Al Karim. I think with that one example, the, the meaning becomes clear. Additional to this is what the scholar must recognize is something known as Al Mushtarak. What is Al Mushtarak? A homonym. In English, the word is a homonym. Example of that is in Al Quran Al Karim where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders the women. To, a woman is divorced, she's divorced. The Quran says she must sit three quru. The word used is uh, the word used is this word is plural of qar. What is the meaning of Qar? Al-Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala said, the meaning of this word is purity. When she's in the three purity periods, when three of those finish, she can marry another man. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala said, the meaning of Quru is the Haid. What is Haid? The menses of the woman. Three menses, when three menses are finished, she can marry another man. <coughs> Based on this one difference, the legal ruling will differ. How a man can give a divorce to a woman and after she sits one to her, he divorces her in one to her. She sits what to her meaning what purity? Haid finishes, one haid finishes, menzies, then another to her, then one haid, then one to her. When that finishes, she is permitted according to Al-Imam Shafi'i to marry another man. But the Hanafis will say, wait, you are not permitted, you must wait one more period of menses. This type of dispute is referred to as Al-Mushtarak, meaning the homonym. When one word in the Quran has how many meanings? Two meanings. Someone may say, why is this found in the Quran? Why is this dispute permitted in the Quran? The response to this objection, there are people who object like this. The response to that objection is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed this dispute. Why? To make this sharia easy for the people, law. Meaning the previous nations would only have one ruling. The previous nations would only have one ruling. If they did not follow that ruling, they were punished. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted in this nation a certain leeway in legal rulings. That's why you have four schools, four Sunni schools. And they differ only in around 20 to 25 percent. But why are they permitted to differ in 20 to 25 percent? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made leeway for us. Like there are <coughs> 10 qira'at, 10 ways of reciting the Quran. There are four schools in leeways in rulings. Did the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa allow this? The answer is yes. Inshallah, Allah willing, in a forthcoming lecture, we will cover why there are disputes in fiqh and jurisprudence. But one example is when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa dispatched a group of companions to Banu Quraiza. He said to them, Do not pray until you reach Banu Quraiza, the, for, the fortification of Banu Quraiza. On the way, they started to dispute. 
One group said the command is literal. We must not pray until we reach Bani Quraiza. Another group of companions, they said the command is not literal. What was meant is that hasten yourself, rush to Bani Quraiza. So they prayed on the way. When the news was taken to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not object to either group, meaning the dispute was permitted. These permissible disputes are the disputes contained within the four schools. So these are also contained in the Quran in words which are known as mushtarak, the hamanim. Likewise, the commentator of the Quran must be, must be familiar with something known as al-muradif. What is al-muradif? A synonym in the Quran. A what? Synonym. Meaning you may have mushtarak was one word with two or more meanings. But a synonym is one meaning with multiple names. Like how? Like al-insan. What does al-insan mean? Human. What does bashar mean? Human. One meaning with two names. Why is insan called insan? Because this word insan is from either from nisyan to forget. We forget so many times. Or uns. Familiarity. Every human likes familiarizing himself with other humans. And why is Bashar called Bashar? Because he has Bashar, which is what? Skin. But the word Bashar and the word Insan refer to the same thing. This is called Muradif in Al Quran Al Karim. Other examples like Al Haraj, difficulty, Al Diq, difficulty. These are words which have uh, one meaning with multiple words. Likewise, the commentator of the Quran should know something known as Al-Isti'ara. What is Al-Isti'ara? Al-Isti'ara is understanding metaphors in the Quran. Understanding what? Metaphor. Different to allegory. This is known, Al-Isti'ara is known as metaphor. Example, in, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَمَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَاهُ is the one who was dead and we gave him life, is this literal or is it a metaphor? The answer is, it is metaphor for the one who was a kafir and he became a Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the metaphor of him like a dead person who was given life. Another example, And a sign for them is the night that we extract from it the daytime. Now this word Naslahu Naslahu in its original meaning it means when you have a goat and you tear off the skin of the goat. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Naslahu Minhun Nahar that the night it were as if the, the night is what torn away and what comes out? The daytime. This is in Al Quran al Karim is an example of a metaphor in Al-Quran Al-Karim which is referred to as Al-Isti'ara. Likewise you have At-Tashbih. At-Tashbih is a simile in the Quran. The word is At-Tashbih. Where the similar to a metaphor but everything is mentioned. Every aspect meaning if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likens one thing to another every aspect is mentioned that this thing is like this in this. This is referred to as being what? at tashbi So we have Mushtarak, Muradif, Al-Isti'ara, at tashbi and uh, Al-Majaz. All these things which the commentator of the Quran must look at. Additional to this, how does the commentator of the Quran take out legal rulings from Al-Quran Al-Karim? Legal rulings. How the commentator of the Quran ex extracts legal rulings that some of the verses of the Quran may be general. This is called Al-Aam. What is it called? Al-Aam. Al-Aam is what? When a verse of the Quran is general and there are no specifics. But likewise, <coughs> you may have something known as Al-Aam al -Makhsus. A general statement is made but then there are specifics to that statement. 
So this is why when scholars warn not students of knowledge but semi-students of knowledge or people who are not even students of knowledge not to take the Qur'an and attempt to derive legal rulings from the Qur'an directly. Why? Because without having a comprehensive understanding of all these things which we have covered like what? Al-Makki, Al-Madani, what else was covered? Al-Layli, what else? Al-Nahari, what else? Al-Safari, what else? Al-Hadari, what else? Al-Shita'i, what else? All these different things. What we just mentioned, uh, Al-Mushtarak, Al-Isti'ara, all these, uh, Al-Firashi, all these different things. Without knowing these different types, a person can be mistaken in how they did attempt to derive legal rulings directly from Al-Quran al kareem or from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So here, there is sometimes a general statement made in Al-Quran al kareem for which there is a specific. Likewise, there may be a statement in the Quran which is specified by the Sunnah. So, a general statement in the Quran is found, <coughs> but what makes it specific? The Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like this, there are so many facets to Ulum Al-Quran, the sciences of Al-Quran al kareem I'm sure from this lecture, we've realized that this is a deep subject. One of the earliest scholars to have uh, written a comprehensive work on this was Abdul Rahman bin al jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala of Baghdad. And later, you had Al-Imam Al-Zarkashi rahimahullah ta'ala who wrote Al-Burhan fi ulum al-Quran. He was followed up by the most comprehensive work. Uh, which is Al-Itqan fi Ulum Al-Quran by Imam Jal- Al-Imam Jalaluddin Abdul Rahman Al-Suyuti Rahimallahu Ta'ala who passed away in the Hijri year of 911. This book is also available in English. He passed away in the year 911. Al-Itqan fi Ulum Al-Quran. A scholar who came after him is Muhammad bin Aqila Rahimallahu Ta'ala. He added to the work of Al-Imam Jalaluddin Abdul Rahman Al-Suyuti Rahimallahu Ta'ala He wrote a book called Al-Ziyadat Wal-Ihsan Fi Ulum Al-Quran This is in 10 volumes I have this work at home In 10 volumes He added so many different aspects to Ulum Al-Quran That there, are, there is not only a 100 types There are over 200 types Meaning different discussions And those discussions go into depth we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to understand our religion correctly and safeguard us from slipping and making errors as well as saving us from this new propaganda or old propaganda but repackaged in order to make young people doubt al Quranul Kareem, in order to place doubts regarding al Quranul Kareem. Inshallah in the coming months in this masjid we should be covering certain subjects once a month that touch upon those things which uh, the orientalists or non-muslims object to regarding al-quran al kareem and the sunnah of the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam inshallah allah willing if there are any questions you can write down those questions and they will be answered in the next session walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen جزا الله عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم ما هو أهله سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين